Uh, welcome everyone. So we're going to start the event now. Um, I would, uh, my name is Daywan. I'm the senior advisor at uh, Cornell Data Science. I would like to introduce today's instructors and his, uh, the instructors for the next three events as well. Uh, this is Ryan. Uh, he's the tech lead. He's also the sub-team lead uh, together with Yuji uh, for our functional team on deep learning. He's lost uh, many hours of sleep and probably skipped a couple classes for this. So please uh, show him a lot of support. Uh, this is Yuji. Uh, Yuji's also the sub-team lead. He's uh, getting more and more involved in, in sort of our implementation. He's some of you may have seen him on doing some demos uh, with uh, classifying animal faces. And, and uh, on Piazza, if you take uh, Ori 4741. So. Alright, so uh, with, with that, I'll pass it over to these two gentlemen. Alright, so thank, first of all, thank you so much for coming. Uh, we're really excited that so many people here are interested in deep learning. Um, like I said, I'm not going to go into trouble introducing which one of us is which, because I think it should be very clear. <laughs> <laughs> so, this, so this is our, uh, the first of a four-part series on deep learning, like they want to mention. Uh, Cornell Data Science now has a dedicated sub-team to deep learning, and this is sort of our way of um, sort of spreading that knowledge to Cornell generally. So, quick show of hands, how many here actually know what deep learning is? Or at least you think you know. Okay, so not that many people. So um, to find out, I'm going to ask uh, the obvious expert, and that would be Google. So let's see. Okay, Google. What is deep learning? According to machine learning mastery, deep learning is a subfield of machine learning concerned with algorithms inspired by the structure and function of the brain called artificial neural networks. Okay, so that was a definition. It wasn't a very descriptive definition. Um, I certainly didn't gain a lot of knowledge from that. But perhaps what's more important is the action that I just took was deep learning in action. So I spoke to my phone, and somehow it understood my voice and turned it into a search query. So how would you, like just conceptually, how would you write a computer program to do that? There's no series of if statements or control flow or logic or anything like that that you can really use to turn a human voice into a search word. You just can't. I can't think of it. I mean, if, if one of you guys can, then like, start a company and like, just go with it. That's, that's awesome. But, um, so, yeah, so that's what deep learning is. It's really applying um, these specific types of models that we'll get into later to these problems that we always thought really was just designed for humans, and uh, it's currently what's like driving AI and machine learning. So how does this all fit into sort of the bigger picture? So what, the terms like artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, deep learning, these are things that you might all have heard, for, heard of before, and these are sort of buzzwords that are used to generate media interest and to attract investors for money, basically. And so artificial intelligence is sort of the biggest category of problem we're dealing with here. And it deals with the problem of trying to make a computer good at a task that previously only humans were thought to be good at. So a game like chess, for example, is a good example of this. And you might have heard of IBM's Deep Blue, it was an algorithm that was very good at playing chess. And so what it did was it would look at every single piece on the board, and it would calculate 10 moves in advance, all the things that you could do, all the things that your opponent could do, and then just do tons of group work calculations and find the best move uh, to do next. And this was quite successful. And then in the late 90s, it was able to beat World Champion. But AI, or at least conventional AI, really struggled with a certain group of problems. Um, so to give you an example of these problems, suppose I wanted to write a computer program that would have that would predict whether I would have died in the Titanic if I had been alive at that time. So first of all, like what do we know about the about the Titanic? We have a list of people who live in the Titanic. We know whether they died, and we know certain characteristics or what we refer to as features about those people. So we know their age, we know their ethnicity, we know their room number, we know perhaps their income. Um, and so these are things that we kind of assume or guess that might be significant towards what they died on. Like perhaps if they were wealthier, they were on a certain area of the ship and uh, were prioritized with lifeboats or something. We don't, but we, don't, we ourselves don't know. I, using my knowledge of the Titanic, can just look at a bunch of people that died on the Titanic and say, oh, like, clearly this person would have died. So that is really what machine learning is about. It's about 
getting a computer to actually learn on its own. So I don't know the answer. I can't figure out how to program something to do this. But I can teach a computer how to do it, and it will learn on its own. The key thing with machine learning is that I need data that has useful features, like page, ethnicity, uh, location on ship, and I need to know a label, so like, did they die or not? Um, so. Yeah, so machine learning, conventional machine learning, we might refer to it later on, has been very, very successful these days, and it's used in things like uh, detecting email spam, so like things like you receive an email from Denise Casaro, you can automatically tag you spam. But the thing is, conventional machine learning, there is a group of problems that it struggles with. And so today we're going to be talking a lot about image classification, and this is one of those things. Because image classification, the way image data is stored is that you just have info about <coughs> pixel. It's like, in this specific pixel, the color is red, and here it's yellow. And like Ryan mentioned, machine learning needs features. But each individual pixel isn't really much of a useful feature. So I can't just look at, say, the top left corner of an image and say, okay, that's yellow, and therefore the whole thing must be, like, I, I don't know. I can't infer anything from just the one thing. And so what deep learning is able to do is it sort of starts one step before. So it's able to generate important features on its own. So, so this, is, this is sort of a good graphic to explain that, where with machine learning, you have the input, say, image of the car, and then someone has done useful feature extraction for you. So it might say um, there is like there are two sort of like whitish regions in the left and on the right. That would be a useful feature to, to use in determining whether something would occur. But the way deep learning works is that it'll do that process automatically. And so it'll just take the image of a car and say, is it a car? Is it a car? So the key point here is that. Well, the key point I really want to hammer about is that deep learning is able to automatically generate it. So, now that we've sort of reached like the current uh, state of machine learning, which is deep learning, um, what are like some of the things that we can use this for? And we'll teach you by the end of the series like how to actually do some of these things. But uh, there are really three areas in which it's most successful. So that's image recognition. Um, we've already developed computer programs and deep learning models that are better than humans at understanding images. So like if I give a computer an image of a cat, there are already computer programs out there that can tell that it's a cat better than you can tell that it's a cat, and faster than you can tell that it's a cat. So that's like hugely applicable, that's used in autonomous cars, that's used in um, all sorts of things. Then there's speech recognition, so like the demo at the beginning, Google Assistant, Alexa, Siri, all these technologies use deep learning. They listen to your voice and then can turn it into text. And then finally, there's natural language processing. So natural language processing is essentially where you look at some text and you try to get useful information out of that text. So for example, if you post a lot on Facebook about a particular topic, natural language processing using deep learning can actually read your post, understand what it is that you were talking about, and then come up with its own opinion of your preferences, your likes, and your dislikes, and cater your Facebook feed towards what you're interested in, what you're most likely to uh, want to see. Um, it's also used in like food reviews and, and Google searches, but uh, so it's just hugely applicable, all sorts of things. And then, so these are like kind of the three pillars of how it's being used in industry, but there's also a lot of really cool cutting edge research that deep learning is in. So, for example, um, AlphaGo is an algorithm that Google DeepMind developed, and essentially what it did is it took this really complicated board game called Go, and the thing that was interesting about Go as opposed to chess is you couldn't calculate all the possible moves in Go. Just, we don't have enough computer power to do that. So for the first time ever, we were Google DeepMind managed to use uh, machine learning and deep learning to actually solve this without like manually programming anything that uh, any rules. So unlike Deep Blue, it used Deep Learning, which is confusing, I realize now. But. <laughs> um, and then Google Translate uses Deep Learning. Um, like I said before, autonomous cars in Siri. And then there's a couple of really interesting creative applications. So what I'm going to show you right now is this thing called Style Transfer. Um, it also originated at Google. And there's been a lot of research since that original paper. But what's going to happen is we're essentially going to use Deep Learning to look at some image, so like let's say Starry Night by Van Gogh, and then restyle a real video into the style of it. So you'll understand better when we play the video. So 
here's the original video, here's the painting on the right, and then the video becomes like the painting. So they did this with a couple things. So here's just the movie. So it's able to preserve the original properties of what was in the video. So you still see the people that were in. All the content is the same, but the style has changed. Which if you think about it, it's a very, very hard thing to do. Yeah. There's no way that this could have ever been done by something that wasn't deep by this. talked a lot about what, what deep learning can do. So what like specifically is deep learning? So deep learning refers to algorithms called neural networks. These are machine learning algorithms. Some of you might have heard of things like support vector machines, random forest, decision trees. These are, these are just a different type of algorithm. And deep learning refers to using very, very complex neural networks. So when a neural network is very, is very, they have things called layers. When there are many of them, we refer to them as being just to clarify real quick, uh, decision trees, support vector machines, linear classifiers, random forest, those are not neural networks. That's old style ML. Neural networks are modern deep learning. The stuff that's like actually like <laughs> it wasn't that because he likes the old style ML. But um, it's not old. <laughs> <laughs> You're old. Still so. <laughs> You're old. It's not old. Uh, but yeah, so neural networks are deep learning. The other things are not. So as you might be able to guess from the name, these were modeled after the brain. They got their additional inspiration from uh, computer scientists trying to make an algorithm that would be able to recreate the thought process that we go through in our brain. Um, but in practice, uh, they've been tweaked a lot since, and they don't actually work like our brain model. And so today we're going to be covering linear classifiers, specifically how to use them to do image recognition. And so the way you can think of this is, so this is an image of a very complex neural network uh, designed by Google. And the way you can think about what we're going to be doing today is sort of coding like one specific box, one of these like red or blue boxes, and then moving on we'll be able to sort of put, string them all together to make a neural network and then look at sort of different, so they're like the red ones, the blue ones, the green ones, I'm looking at different types of architectures of linear, uh, sorry, of neural networks, and that's what we'll be get into in like the second and third and fourth and so on. And so, with any machine learning problem, the thing you want to do is that you want to map to model a function from your inputs to your outputs. So specifically things like what we're going to be doing today for image classification is that you want to model a function from all the images that you're considering to all the categories of those images. So I want so a function, mathematically speaking, is I give it an input, it will give me a unique output. I want a function that says, I give it an image of, say, a cat, and it says, this is a cat. That's what I want to be able to do. And so mathematically speaking, what we're doing is we're trying to model some function. This is just some function in, in uh, 2D space. And so what a neural network is able to do is that it's able to, once we give it data points, it will automatically learn what the best function to fit is. So you can see here, we can just add some random points somewhere, and using a neural network, it's automatically able to model what function is sort of the best. So things like, how, how do I sort of best approximate this function? How do I get a function that, if I give it images of cats, it'll actually tell me which are cats. If I give it images of day, day one, it'll tell me this is day one. And it's old. And it's old. <laughs> So let's break down this problem a little bit more um, to make it more concrete. So on the left, we have our example image. It's very pixelized, but some of you may recognize it as an image of Abraham Lincoln. Um, however, and, and on the right, we've got five categories. We're trying to decide whether this image is a human, a chimpanzee, a cat, a dog, or a boat. Right? So obviously, we look at the image and we say, OK, it's a person. Even though it's super pixelized, I can still tell that it's a person. Um, a computer can't do this. Because a computer only sees this. And that's not only incomprehensible to the computer, that's also incomprehensible to us in that format. Right? So to explain a little bit more, every single one of these pixels has a brightness associated with them. And that brightness is a number between from 0 to 255. So 255 is white, 0 is black, 
Um, and then that's just a grid, right? And so we can turn this grid into a vector. Um, so in this case, if the image is m rows long and n columns, then it's going to be a vector in uh, m times n space. So real quick, show of hands. How many of you are like familiar with this notation? Or better question, how many how many of you are unfamiliar with this notation? Okay. So there's a couple of people here. So um, just we're gonna use this like throughout the lecture. So basically all you need to know is that the thing that this is raised to tells you how like what dimension the data is. So for example, if you're dealing in 2D, it's R to the 2, 3D, R to the 3, and so forth. So this in this case is m times f. So it's just a really, really long vector. Yeah, so, so the R is just short for real numbers. So for example, if I had an image that was 10, 10 pixels tall, 10 pixels wide, I now have a vector that's the length one I've done. That's how this works. Also, if you guys ever have questions, just interrupt us and So basically, uh, as you saw in that previous image, we had um, some a bar graph over here, and that was essentially representing how confident our algorithm is that it's for every class. So it, it really doesn't think it's a bow. It like a tiny bit thinks it's a chimpanzee, but it's pretty certain that it's a human. So this thing on the right uh, is actually a vector as well. Yes? Why would you store that as a vector instead of a Right. So you, we actually use it as an array when we hit convolutional neural networks. So two lectures from now, this will be an array. But for right now, for the purposes of how linear classifiers work, we keep them as a vector. Um, and yes? So is this like a row-wise score, a column-wise score? How, how does the image get constructed from a linear image? So yeah, it, it so doesn't really matter whether it's column-wise or You could stretch it out this way, you could stretch it out that way. And sort of to expand on why we're not making an array. So for a linear classifier, it just considers each, each pixel independent. <laughs> Later on, we'll consider groups of pixels at once. But right now, we're just looking at this one, and that one, and that one, and that one, and then looking at all together for that. Um, but as you can see here, like there, if we have five classes, we could actually represent this as a vector in R5. So the number, like the, the confidence that it's a particular um, class could be represented as a number, right? Like in this case, from 0 to 1, 1 being 100% certain, 0 being not at all certain. And so this could be a vector where it's like 90, and then 5, and then 2, and 1, and then 0, let's say. So with that in mind, let's think about how this is going to work mathematically. Um, so again, we want, to, I, we want to generate some scores for each class. So the higher the number, the more likely it is that it's that class. And um, it's just, here, the, here, the length of the yellow bar, this is my score. Yeah. So, uh, scores can be represented as vectors, and we're going to call them y hat. And in this case, if there's k classes, then our vector is in rk. So in the previous example, there were five classes, the vector is in r hat. So this is sort of the constraint of the data that we're providing. So if I'm told, I'm given a bunch of images, and I'm said, classify whether this is a, uh, an apple, a pineapple, or a lemon. Now k is three. If I'm told, I want to be able to classify between 100 different breeds of dogs, now k is so um, our inputs were the images, and they are in d-dimensional space. So for example, if the image was um, n time, like n rows, n columns, then d is equal to n times n. So uh, yeah, basically, we just turn the image into a very, very long vector, and then that's our input. And then we have desired outputs, right? Like, in order to train the neural network or the linear classifier that this is a human and this isn't a human, we have to say this is a human, this isn't a human. It can't just do it by magic, right? So we're, with every single image that we provide it to train on, we also have to tell it which class it is. We have to tell it whether it's a dog or a cat or a human or a chimpanzee. So these labels are also an R to the K. And essentially, um, it's just going to be a one in the location of the class that it should be, and zero is everywhere else. So in that previous image, uh, the target class should be a one and then four zeros, because human was the first uh, class. So for those of you who might not be as familiar with machine learning, the key here is that for an algorithm to learn from experience, 
we have to, at the beginning, give it data and tell it what the answer is. So if I give it an image of a cat, I have to tell it that this is a cat. And then once I've given it lots and lots and lots of images, then we'll learn the trends between what makes this type of image a cat and sort of what makes this type of image not a cat. So at the end of the day, now that we've described the inputs and the outputs, um, the classifier is just a mathematical function. It's from d-dimensional space, which again was the input space, and it goes to k-dimensional space, which was the class space. So, and we want it to be where the predicted output, which is y hat, is as close as possible to the actual value, which is y. So we're going to be using this notation a lot. So does anyone have any questions or things you want to clarify about the way this problem is set up or notation? So as we mentioned, today we're going to be talking about linear classifiers. So what that means is that this function f is linear. And so for those of you who have taken uh, an analogy or anything like that, you'll know that the most simple models, so the most simple functions that we can draw, so in any space is just a straight line. If you just ask me to draw on that board the simplest function I can think of, I just draw a straight line. And so what that means is that if I have input data x, that means my function is linear in x. That means the coefficients of each x is 1. I'm not squaring it, I'm not cubing it, I'm not taking square roots, I'm not taking logs, whatever. So, yeah, just to reiterate, um, so what this does is, with, a, with an image, we just said that I've got a very, very long vector, and to, do, to take a linear function of that vector, so I'm taking a weighted sum of the things, because each each pixel is a number, say, say I have a length, a vector of x of length 10. So I have x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, and up to 10. And so to get a linear function of that, I multiply x1 by some number, x2 by some number, x3 by some number, and so on, and then I add them up. That's what a linear function is. And so these sub-numbers, uh, which we'll refer to as the weights, these are what the, the machine learning algorithm needs to learn. Because these are the things that will make my function sort of an approximate to what the true answer is. This is what will make uh, this true. And so to give sort of a concrete example of how this is going to work, so here I have an image. It's a black and white image like the one I had before. And so I'm imagining that, just for the sake of imagination, imagine this pixel is 2 by 2. So I only have four pixels. Right? One here, one there, one here, one there. And so what I do is I stretch that image out. And so I have an intensity value in each pixel. Right? So it's 56. There, so 231, that's probably white, 24, it's very dark, 2, that's like basically four. So that's how my image, that's what my image looks like to the computer. And then what I do is I multiply it by a matrix of weights W. So here, so for people who might have forgotten how to multiply matrices or they're still getting familiar with it, so what we do is, so to get a linear function, you do, so F, is wx plus b. So this is just a linear function of x. And so just to go over some of the notation, this, the input vector xi, so I'm saying this is my i input image. And this is a vector in rd, where d is where the height times the width. So here d would be 4. And my prediction, so I'm trying to classify this image into whether it's a cat, a dog, or a ship. And so these are the predictions that this specific model that I have right here generated. And then these are my weights. So this is a matrix of k by d. So I have k, I have k columns, and I have d, sorry, I have k rows, sorry. And I have d columns. And k, so go again, k is the number of classes here, which is 3, and d is the number of pixels that I have. And so we'll get into this a bit later. So I have to add a bias term so that I'm able to model sort of a wider range of functions. But you don't really need to worry about it. Yeah, we'll, we'll cover that more in depth in a couple slides. Yeah. And so this is, like I said, this is the answer that I provided in the beginning. So I want my dog score to be high, which I'm pretty comfortable with this dog. And I don't really think it's a ship, but for the sake of imagination. Uh, so yeah, I want these, these two to be low. Because I don't, I, don't, I don't think that's a ship. Like the true answer is that's not a shift, that's not a cat. And so, 
how, how, how have I generated these scores? So I'm just doing uh, matrix multiplication, so I multiply those two numbers together, and these two, then those two, then those two, then add them all up, um, and then add the 1.1 1 .1 over there, and then I get this, which is negative 96. And then I do the same thing, this time I multiply this row by that column, and I add this, and I get that. Same thing here, and then, so what now I have is this clear? Where did W come from? So W, um, so here I said, these are just learned magically by the classifier. So these are what the neural network has control over, and then we'll explain later how this sort of, right, we'll refer to it as magic, it's not magic, and we'll explain later how, how specifically these models are able to learn what values of W or give these scores that agree with what, what the true answer is. Oh, yeah? Why did you put 437 as a dog score? Um, so this this matrix, so I've just I've just ordered um, I've just decided beforehand that the first element should correspond to what however much I think acceptance of cat, and then the second one should be dog. Second one, third one should be shift. That makes sense. Yeah. How did you stretch it to a single column? Is it uh, sometimes then? Yeah, the image. Yeah. So I'm just imagining for the, for the purposes of this example that this is a two by two image. Uh, like how do I get two by two to the four? Yeah. I can just like take this one, stick it to the list, take that one, stick it on the list. I just like read one row at a time and then just stick them all in one. Uh, yeah. Wait. So this is the why half like and the least squares of prosecution, or is that sort of just like notation for like prosecution? Uh, so the why hat is the predictions that my model generated. So what did my model think this is? After comparing the y hat with y, yeah. did it change w so as to make y hat more approximately equal to y? Yeah, so that's exactly what we're going to get into. So we want, right, like I said earlier, we want y hat. We want our model to think, to predict things that are close to equal. Yeah, so that's exactly what we're going to do. Yeah. Just let's take a quick question. Is this doing the score for each point? Each for, each, for each pixel is it generating the score? No, it's generating a score for each class. I know, it was for each pixel overall. Overall, it's just for that. Right, so yeah, I'm imagining that this is a 2 by 2. Actually doing? How do I interpret what I'm seeing here? Right? 
So essentially what's happening is every single element of that row corresponds to some pixel in the image. And the value of that weight represents how much that pixel of the image should contribute to the class score. So again, if the weight, for example, is a very large value, then having a white pixel on that pixel would mean that the class score suddenly increases a lot. And if the weight is a negative value, then having a white pixel means that the class score is going to decrease a lot. And having a value close to zero means that it doesn't really matter what the pixel is, the class score is not going to change much. So essentially, what the model is doing is it's learning which of the pixels in the image are the most important. And so it's going to come up with some sort of internal understanding of what kind of, which, which pixels matter and which pixels don't matter, and if they matter, like, should it increase the probability that it's a cat or should it decrease the probability that it's a cat? So to kind of make this more concrete, um, let's take a look at a little bit, something other than dogs and cats. Let's take a look at numbers, right? So here's an image of a zero, and the zero is painted in white. So that means that everything along the zero has a high value, something close to 255. And everything else is a value of zero. So what I just displayed are the, each of the weights for each of the different classes. So this is a row of W, this is a row of W, this is a row of W, and so forth. And so there's 10 rows of W for 10 digits. So let's take a look real quick at the weights for class zero, right? So what does this mean? First of all, black means that the weight is close to zero. Blue, and these are just these are just things that we've done to make it easier, right? Um, so in this case, they're just numbers, but we're displaying it as an image. So black means the weight is close to zero. Blue means the weight is positive. It's it's a decently large positive value. And red means that the weight is a decently large negative value. Um, before I continue on, does anyone have questions about how to interpret what they're seeing here? Like, not necessarily how to interpret, but like the difference between blue and red, <coughs> like how these are weights. Okay, so what does this mean? Out here, you'll notice that it's kind of in the shape of a zero, right? So this means that if there are, if there is ink in this region, i.e., if there are high values in this region, it's very likely that it's, that's a zero. And same thing here, and same thing here. If there's ink in any of this region, it actually doesn't matter at all whether there's ink in any of this region, because it's black. And then if there's ink in this region, it means it's very likely to not be a zero. And so we can kind of see something similar for one. We see that this is the region in which if there's ink, it should most strongly predict that it's a one. And if there's ink in these spots, it's probably not a one. Um, and so these are decently understandable, right? They actually, you can kind of see how this is a zero and this is a one. And then we get to this image. And it's not really clear how this is a zero. So an important thing to note is that your weights aren't always that easy to understand. Um, I oftentimes, I can't just look at the weights and say, oh, like, I see that this is trying to detect two. Um, it's not really realistic, necessarily. But the reason why this looks like this is because if I were to draw a two, Right, I can draw a two in a couple of different ways. Draw a two like this. Draw a two like this. I mean, I could just draw another two. You know, um, like a two has a particular shape. So towards the top here, almost all of them look about the same, which is why this is blue. And there's some stuff on the bottom, so that's why this is blue. Now you might ask, well, why is this red, right? And that's because I could probably draw a 3 that looks somewhat like a 2, right? <laughs> okay, so it's not a 2. So you draw a 3. Draw a 6 and look like a 2. Yeah, you can draw, so I could draw a 6 and look like a 2. That's, that's a better example. It's like a 6 has stuff on the top, a 6 has stuff on the bottom, but it doesn't have stuff in the middle like the 2 does, right? So this is saying if there's a line here, it's definitely not a 2. So like in the case of the 3, there's a line here, and so it's even more certain that it's not a 2. Because the 3 has stuff in the top, the 3 has some stuff on the bottom, um, so it's kind of close to a 2. But if we didn't have these negative weights, 
then it might accidentally get caught by this. And then up here are some of the images for the other numbers, and as you can see, they're even harder to understand. Um, so, but yeah, so that's what your weights are doing. Again, to summarize, the weights of the model are determining how important particular pixels are. If it's large positive value, it's very important, and it contributes. It says, it's like, if there's a pixel here, it's likely that it's a particular class. If it's negative, it means if there's a pixel here, like a high pixel, it's definitely not the class. And if it's zero, it means it doesn't care. Right. I won't do this, sorry. Um. So, can we just write intent on numbers? <laughs> so, this thing you'll notice that this thing, like the blue bit looks like it drew, but it's not the middle bit missing. So, that's because I can draw a 6 with that line down middle there. I can also draw a 7 with that line down middle there. I can also draw a 9 with that line down middle there. And so, this model doesn't really care what's down the middle because it's only trying to tell the difference between 2, 3, 6, 7, 9, whatever. It's not actually learning to see 2. Like, like you, it doesn't read 2 like you can read it to. It can't tell the difference between a 2 and, say, an A and some Chinese symbol or whatever. It only knows the difference between 0, 1, 2, etc. So, moving back to, so someone asked a question about what did it mean for what I said a while back that I want, what I want is I want my dog score to be high and this is a dog, and I want these other things to be low because that's not what they are. And so, you were right in saying that these scores are hard to interpret. Yeah. Um, so, like, my question is, uh, the value cat, that seems yeah. like they're in the same orientation. Like, if there's a cat inside like, of these units that you're trying to classify, it won't recognize it because it's not like, for example, like all of the pictures you have, yeah. it's the subject of the picture in the center, but like, you the images in the side. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's a weakness of a linear classifier. It will have to think that a cat on the left and a cat on the right are two different things. And we'll get into, when we get into convolutional neural networks, which is our third uh, workshop, we'll cover it. algorithms are able to recognize the cat on the left and the cat on the right are the same. Uh, anything else? Yeah. Um, so since W has words that are really equal to the size of the image, how yeah. does this model deal with images that have different sizes? Uh, we just resize them into this. Okay. Yeah. So. so yeah, um, so getting back to this scores thing, we were saying that um, we want the score to be high if we're a class that, that um, represents a true answer and low for everything else. And, but these are hard to interpret, and it'd be much easier if I was able to look at the image and say, this is 80% a cat, 10% a dog, and 10% something else. I want to give it something like this. I want to be able to look at this image and say, yeah, pretty high probability that it's a leopard. I kind of think it's a jelly, or I'm not really sure. And there are other things that I might do. And so the way we do that is we take all the scores, and then we apply this function, which we'll call, what's called the softmax function. And what this does, it'll, so this is, uh, the vector that I get is an output, and so for each, so for the J index, it's uh, e to the power of the original one with the same index, and then the sum of all of them. And so it doesn't really matter if you uh, so have a strong mathematical understanding of this function. All you really need to know is that it'll squash any arbitrary vector of values and make it so every single number is between zero and one, and then once you add them all together, you get one. So now you have a vector of probabilities. So that's so sort of the fundamental axiom of probability is that and the probability of any event is between 0 and 1, and the probability of all events is equal to 1. Does that make sense? Yeah. Wait, well, well, what dictates that the scores are all on the same scale? Uh, <coughs> what do you mean same scale? Yeah. Well, what I mean is, right, what if one of the models, for whatever reason, output scores that are much higher, so when you apply the soft max function to it, that one will always be much higher. Well, so for, for one model, I have one W. And so the scale, so right, when I multiply these by one image, it will sort of be on the same scale. But I'm not really sure um, what the question is. Could you rephrase it? Yeah. Okay, uh, I think I understand that. So. Okay. okay. So again, like don't worry too much about the math. Like it's 
not that important. The key thing is it squashes it, and it's probably building up. Yeah. So now we don't even have to worry about like high low, right? It's easier for me to say if I give it an anchor to chat, I don't know how high the chat score should be. Should is it like is five big enough? Is ten big enough? Is five hundred big enough? But now I know that one is big because no matter, like if it's hundred percent sure it's a chat, then that's big. Enough. So we talked about sort of mathematically, uh, sorry, visually interpreting what uh, the W matrix looked like, so what each of the rows looked like. So we talked about things like sort of um, if the weights are low in a, in a pixel corresponding to a certain location, then like there shouldn't be any white in there. Um, and so the way mathematically these things work is that we said that we can think of each of these image, <coughs> images as very long vectors. And so what this means is that mathematically you can think of them as points in very high dimensional space. So if I have a vector in 2D, say 1, 1, I can plot that on this space, it be like, say, here. And then if I have a point 2, 1, then maybe it's here. And so I can do that in very, very high dimensional spaces too. So in like 100 dimensional spaces, I can just plot all the images I have in some graph that I won't be able to visualize. And so what a linear classifier does is it will draw a line between these points such that it's able to discriminate between specific classes. So this red line here is discriminated between images that are cars and images that aren't cars. And so on to the deer and the airplane and so on. And so we mentioned that we were sort of adding this term B here, which I didn't really explain. But what that term is doing is that it's making sure that, um, so if you think about a line in 2D, the Y is A plus B, if B is zero, then that line has to go through this orange here. But if B is non-zero, then I can sort of control where that line crosses this axis, and so I can draw lines anywhere. Um, but we'll see that, uh, so, uh, sorry, to clarify that's on the language I've used on this slide, a hyperplane is a higher dimensional generalization of a line. So in 3D space, I, I draw planes instead of lines, those are linear, um, linear functions. And so in in any n-dimensional space, an n minus one dimensional structure is a hyperplane, and it'll look like a line looks like to you in 3D. But the thing is, hyperplanes <coughs> might not actually be good enough all the time, because say if I plotted all my car images, and some of them were over here, some of them were over here, and they sort of like went around in a circle. Imagine these were all cars, and everything in the middle, those were cars. Then I couldn't actually draw a line that would separate cars from not cars, because any line that I drew was going to chop them on that. And so I want to be able to draw some non-linear function. And that's a fundamental limitation of um, the algorithms that we're going to be covering today, which are linear functions. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, so we've been talking about magically probable that it's a cat. 
And that is the, out, the label probability, what we want the model to predict. And our generated probabilities are also a vector of the same size, and it's some numbers between 0 and 1. And so we want to see how well our y hat, our predicted probability, matches our y, which is our true probability. And so this function is going to do that. We put our y hat in here, we put our y in here, multiply the two, and then sum it over all the different classes. And then that gives us just a regular number, just a scalar number, and that's going to tell us how well our model is doing. So, what if y hat is zero? If y hat is zero, uh, so it can never be zero. Um, technically, if it was exactly zero, so like if your weights all were zero, or the weights all sum to zero, then you would just like be dividing by zero, and then the program would just be really sad. <laughs> yes? The y hat, the y, and the normal y is the given answer, right? Yeah, so again, uh, the, this y, just regular y, is the true answer. It's what the images are labeled as. And this y hat is our predicted answer. It's the output of our model. Yes? Um, it looks there like you're taking a lot of an individual uh, component of the vector. Uh, why is it guaranteed that no component can be zero? Oh, um, a particular component of the vector can be zero, right? So it's fine if this is zero. Um, Again, that's, that's going to be completely fine. Um, what matters, sorry, I think, okay. So, this can be zero. I, I actually lied to the guy on this. This can be zero. The softmax cannot be zero. So the output of your softmax function, y hat, the entire thing, can't be zero. An element of y hat can be zero. And an element of y can be zero. But not all the elements of y hat or yi. At least something in there has to be non-zero. Like they have to add to one because these are all probabilities, right? So for a given element, this calculation could be zero. Um, like this would be zero, and this would be zero. But at the end of the day, the entire but there's going to be something non-zero in the vector. That being said, when you multiply them together, the results are actually zero. So you can have a zero loss across our world. It is a thing that. We have. Log of zero is not defined. Say again? Log of zero is not defined. Right. But what happens is you can have a very... So, for example, log, let's say this is zero. So it predicts that there's zero probability for a particular class. But if the true class is zero, then zero times even a... So, like, log of zero is a large number, right? Zero times a large number is still just zero. So that's why it's still going to be there. If, if you're talking about like specifically, yes, log of zero is undefined, I think there's some adjustment that computers make by adding in very, very small numbers. It would never get to zero because it's e to the something, right? So e to the something is never zero. Which right, but they can be pretty close to zero. And also, at, this isn't necessarily going to be zero. But this is and will be zero for certain uh, numbers. So like zero times some other number, so it's zero. So you, as long as it predicts properly, it's like, uh, yeah, as long as it's predicting something properly. So like, let's say this was one, log of one is, oh god, wow, zero. Yes. Well, I'm an engineer, okay. So log of one is zero, and then one times zero is zero. So again, it's still a low loss. It's only when they don't match that it's going to be so this is a specific loss function. It's going to be one that we're using today. When you code this, you will not have to do any math whatsoever. There are also many other loss functions that people will use. And so you don't have to worry too much about how the math works. Yes. So assuming the loss is not zero, how do you account for the fact that like, it doesn't let you learn what your training data is and it actually like, works? Assuming that, well, if the loss is zero, then you know that it works well. Because in order to get zero loss, that means the predicted probabilities have to match the general, the actual Right, yeah, so we want to minimize the training set, and there are the loss on the training set, and there are other steps we will take to ensure that the yep. model generalizes to testing. So, at the end of the day, our goal is to get this as small as possible. Um, but right now, we haven't introduced how W and V are trained, right? Right now we said they're set by magic and they're just magically good. 
But that's not how that works. So there's an algorithm that we're about to explain as to how to actually set those values. Are there any other questions? Okay. So, okay. So we told you that percent magically. We want to minimize the loss function. The smaller values are better. Um, but how do we actually know how to change the weight of the biases? So, in order to explain this concept, I'm going to use an analogy, and I'm going to use the analogy of being on a hill blindfolded. So, suppose I made the mistake of going with Yuji on a camping trip, and he's just mugged me and took all my money and let me blindfolded on the mountain, with my hands tied behind my back. And I needed to get to some city that was down at the base of the mountain, right? How would I do this? If I'm blindfolded, how do I find my way down the mountain? Well, obviously, I, I don't know where I am on the mountain, but I know like the, the ground around me, right? So I can feel with my feet and try to figure out which way the hill slopes. And so as long as I walk down the hill, then eventually I'll arrive at the base of the mountain. So suppose like the base is over there, I just look at where I am at any given point in time, I find the slope of the hill, and I just kind of meander along with my eyes closed, and eventually, like, I'll reach here because I'm always going downhill. So, this is actually the same way that you would minimize any arbitrary function in the gradient. Sorry, is it's all your compass. Yes. So, the assumption here is that there's no little potholes. There's, there's only one minimum. And You'll, we'll find out later that neural networks don't have that assumption, but it's actually not important for them to not have that assumption because of how neural networks work. We'll explain that a little bit like, in, in later lectures. But um, for now, we're assuming that there's just exactly one minimum. So we're not, we're never going to like try to go downhill and then all of a sudden, like, if we feel around me and everything is uphill, I'll know that I'm at the base of the hill. It's not going to be some mini hill. So if I started up here, I don't know where I am on the line because I don't I don't know where this is. I know my location, though, let's say. Um, so let's say I know like through, through like where I started. This is like where I started, and uh, I just kind of use math to determine the slope of the line at this point, just regular calculus. And then I follow that and I move a little bit in the direction and I keep doing that, and eventually, like I'll reach the bottom. Of it. Are there any questions on this? This is cut up. Oh, yes. Yeah, so like I said before, the function has to be convex in order to guarantee that you reach the bottom of the hill. Uh, for those of you that don't know, convex function just means that there's, no, like I said before, there's no mini potholes. It's just there's one minimum. So then, so then why do we expect the gradient to be Right. So you can do that for linear regression. Um, you can't do that for neural networks. So we're trying to teach you a method that will work when we get into neural networks. When we use neural networks, we'll have so many different, uh, we'll be dealing with a function in like a million dimensional space. That's how to calculate the gradient and set it to zero. I'm going to have to solve the equation with a million variables in the data for now. So, again, oh, sorry. Oh, I, I was just wondering what function that you're actually grabbing with. Oh, that, 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 that's just an example. Yeah. Yeah. Which is yeah. arbitrary. It's just example. It was from your point. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, mathematically what this means is that if we know the gradient of the loss function, um, then we know how to adjust our parameters. So gradient is just a vector that represents the direction of greatest increase of the slope. So if we take the negative of the gradient, we now have the direction of greatest decrease. So if we just update each parameter of W, so now W is n elements of that machine. One number. Then we can find the partial derivative of the loss function with respect to that element um, times some very small number to indicate that I'm taking only a small step and I'm taking a very large step. And then subtract that by the current value. And so what this is doing is it's, it's just updating the, the weights and the exact encapsulated before. So in this scenario, um, my height, in, in the previous scenario, my height was my loss function, and my x and y were my two parameters. So my location in space were my two parameters. 
And every time I took a step, I was up adjusting those brackets. So that is, does anyone understand like that analogy? Okay. So this is the function. Again, the good thing about TensorFlow is it actually knows what this value right here is. And so we don't have to do that math. It's a good thing because apparently we don't know what log one is. Um, you may be wondering what alpha was. Alpha is the learning rate. Um, and it's called a hyperparameter. It's not something that the network learns by itself. It's something that we have to manually set. And usually alpha is something very small, like 0 0.01 or 0 0.0001. And the reason why it's small is because, so back to the analogy before, suppose the minimum was this little black box on the stage here. And I was pretty close to that minimum. If I took too big of a step, then I just pass it, and I wouldn't know. So I have to take very small steps to make sure I actually end up on the correct spot. So again, we manually set that, and it's called a hyperparameter. Anything that we manually set that isn't learned is called a hyperparameter. Anything that is learned by the network is called a parameter. So W is a parameter, B is a parameter. Those two things are parameters. Yep. This is a hyperparameter. Right. Even if the learning rate is set too high, if it's a complex function, will we like still come back? Or like, could it end up like a new mutation? It's the same thing, for example, like a simple 2D example. I have, this is a complex function, right? I'm here. I take my step size was too big. Now I'm over here. The grade is pointing this way. Now I take another big step. Now I'm over here. Now I'm over here. Now I'm over here. I never get to the. Yeah. So how do you pick which is a good alpha value? Uh, so pick it, trial and error, yeah. usually. Trial and error, and then sort of take big steps at the beginning, and then when I think I'm close, take smaller steps. Yeah. If you make it too small, it's just a limitation. Right. It's just a really long amount of time. Yeah, so that's a good point. So the smaller alpha is, the longer it's going to, if I'm always taking tiny steps, and it's going to take me ages to reach there. So the best thing to do is to take larger steps in the beginning, and then once I've been training for a while, I guess that I'm probably decently close, so I start to take smaller steps. Uh, do you have a question? Uh, how would you play that? Would you say, like, save the model and then reload the whole thing and train it that way? Or would you like, have it automatically? Adjust the learning rate? Yeah, maybe you can do it automatically, and TensorFlow actually just implemented that for us. So. Yep. Uh, it was just, just going to be a comment. The actual way of determining alpha, uh, some can be fixed, but there are other methods that, have, that you can automatically vary uh, the alpha. Yep. For the purpose of it's like just not necessarily very good. There are, there are algorithms like if I if I can the whole thing, like if I'm walking in the same direction all the time, then I imagine that I can just keep going there. So I imagine I can take bigger steps for a bit. So, 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 that when I change so the thing we'll be using in our actual like implementation will be something that is intelligent enough to decide I've been moving in this direction for a while, let me just speed up a little bit. Or uh, now it's starting to change, let me just slow down. Like, like a ball rolling down the hill, if I it go in the same direction, it will speed up, and then when it's like change the direction. So our way of doing it will actually have some sort of momentum associated with every single parameter in the model, which is more complex than this function, but it's the exact same concept at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, he does how it connects to the big picture, taking an input. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if we do this, then this will tell us this. This right here is the formula on how to move. W a little bit closer to something that's good. Remember, because what this is telling us is which direction should we move, this term right here tells us which direction should we move W to improve the loss function. So as long as we have the loss function. Yeah, so, so I have an input image x, I multiply it by some W, and then I get out of this, right? And so my loss function depends on what my W's were. Because, because my, my predictions depend on what W was. Yeah, right? So then I want to minimize loss, so I change W such that loss gets smaller. And so the loss gets smaller, and so my model will be better. So for the input, you first calculate F, the loss Yes. And yes. then update the parameter. Yes. Yes. yes, and you do that over and over and over and over until eventually you reach something that you think is decent. That is for each input. And then for the entire input set, you do that again. Um, so that's a good question. Basically, what, what he asked is, do I only use one input for every time I do this, or do I like constantly feed in new inputs? 
Um, the actual way that you do it is you average loss function over several inputs, and then you do this. And then you'll do that many new times. Every time with a new batch, we call it, of input images. And so that is called mini batch grading instead. Um, it still is the exact same concept as this. Yes? Is the W here one, lo one row of the uh, capital W matrix? It's one element. One element. Yeah. Okay. Right. So for a complex neural network, I'll have tons of these small numbers. Mm -hmm. And that's why neural networks have only become feasible recently, because computers are now able to handle calculating tons of these ones. Yeah. Luckily, since today we're doing like classifiers, it's a lot simpler. But we're trying to teach you a method so that it will, when we get to neural networks, you'll be able to understand what's going on. Yes? Well, if the function value takes a long time, then do you evaluate the full gradient? Uh, the full like every time you, uh, what's this thing? One way gradient, you have to do the number of parameters uh, times the function evaluation. And if the function evaluation is long, do you like only use a subset of the <coughs> No. I, I don't actually have to evaluate the functions every step. I only have to calculate the gradient. No, he's saying, like, could, to, like, could I do this to a couple of friends? So that's what you're saying, right? I mean, yeah. So, technically you could, but I don't think it would be a good approach. And that is because the moment you change one parameter, the other parameters are going to start changing as well. Or, like, the, the um, it's not necessarily the parameters going to start changing, but, like, the way that those parameters interact is not easy to understand. And so usually you have to do it. Okay. Okay. Any more questions on this? So is that a is that a gradient descent thing training each every single element in the wave matrix at a time or is it training up back? You don't train alpha. You set alpha bit. No, you you train all the W's, right? You're updating all of them. Okay, does that does that train one at a time or yeah. this, this is the equation for one at a time, I could write the index for equation such that it is all the time. Yeah. Yeah. You ever look at the second order uh, property? That was the thing we were that's talking about, like, that I talked about using this all the time. That's momentum. Yeah. Do they, do they ever do that? Yes, yeah. they, they do. do. And we'll do that. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Well. Okay. Okay. Any more questions? <coughs> okay. So, okay. So, that. Yeah. Quick summary. <coughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, true. Uh, so, just to summarize all the terms we've mentioned so far. So parameters are things that are learned by the model. So our W and our B, those are the things that we have control over. We can change those so that our function models the, the function that we want it to model. We want it to be close to a function that sort of outputs the true measure. And then, so each image is a vector on X and is a d-dimensional vector. And D is the number two. And so with each image, we have an associated label, uh, Y, uh, with K classes. So for example, I have an image of 100 pixels, and then I have a vector of five classes where it has a one in what the actual image is, and then zero for us. And then, so our data set consists of just a lot of these. Uh, we'll be dealing with a data set of size, I think, 6,000 or something like that. Yeah. I thought it was the And then our prediction on each image is a vector of probabilities. So uh, again, k is the same as before. I generate a, a probability for each class. So like 10% dog, 80% cat, 10% both. <coughs> and then the loss function is our way of measuring how we are model is. How different are our predictions from the true answer? And then what we want is we want a w and b so that l is small. So we want the difference between our predictions and the true answer to be small. So we minimize l using gradient descent. And then alpha is a hyperparameter, and that's something we have to set for. So it's why it's, yeah. So does anyone have sort of questions about the big picture, like how this problem is set up, what, what are the steps we need to do to create <coughs> We're going to be moving into the coding portion after this. So if you don't understand something about the theory, um, ask now, otherwise you can ask us after the lecture. Or post on Slack. Or post on Slack. Yeah. Oh yeah. I know about Slack. Um, we'll be posting all the code that we use on Slack. So if you haven't already, go to cdsdwarning.slack.com and set up that. If by chance you don't have a cornell.edu email address, then just let me know. Yeah. Do you repeat the name of the channel? So cdsdwarning. C, D, S, D, learning, all over it. Uh, if you go to the Facebook event, there will be a link to it there. Yes? In the gradient descent step, how does the 
partial derivative calculated? <coughs> Say again? Yeah, uh, uh, how's the partial derivative calculated? Um, you have to know with just using like regular matrix multivariable calculator. Um, but <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get into next time more efficient ways to quickly calculate radius or large and large number of terms. Yeah, but um, since that's like something that we didn't really want to get into this lecture, we just, just we straight kind of leaving that as an exercise for y'all just to know that we need this value. Luckily, Pentacle does it for us. So we don't actually need to you know ourselves, we can be a little bit. We don't have to program that in there. Okay, so we're going to be using the sidebar 10 data set. Um, you'll notice that these images are actually in color. And so there's 10 classes, and there are 50,000 training images and 10,000 testing. So what that means is that when we train our model, when we're trying to update WB, we're doing it on this group of images, the 50,000, and then we're going to evaluate, once it's totally finished training, we're going to evaluate its performance to see how well we actually did in the end on these 10,000 test images. So every image, is, if these are a couple of examples, they're very small images, they're 32 by 32, and um, the subject is in the center of the image. So someone asked before about what happens if I move like the cat around the image. In this case, it's just centered on the beginning question, so it's going to mitigate that issue. So, and of course we're going to be using TensorFlow, which is just a machine learning library that Google uh, open sourced in 2015. And uh, we're going to be using the Python version of it because that's the most stable, it's the one that's been developed the most. Uh, there is a C++ version and a Java version, but they are less developed. Um, so that's why we prefer to use the Python one. So as we sort of transition into more of a coding tech, this would be less us talking to you, more just you doing stuff. Um, uh, so, we ask most of you to try and install TensorFlow um, beforehand, but if you haven't been able to do that or you need help, then you can ask us or you can ask, uh, we have some people from CES who we've asked to help, us, help us out, uh, who have some experience with this. So, uh, if you guys just want to stand up so people know who you are. Uh, yeah, so these are people you can ask for help. Kevin, Cameron, Luca, Shalom, and you can also ask Dave one too. I'm the wisdom holder. So, how many of you have been able to install an Anaconda engine? Or I guess you had.
download that file and then open a Jupyter notebook. If you don't know how to do that, yell at one of the TAs or me. All right. Make sure the directory you start your Jupyter notebook in is at least above the file you down, the folder you downloaded. In other words, just open your prompt and type in Jupyter notebook. Yeah, I'm doing it for you now. Does anyone need help? No. Also, if you're, if you're using Anaconda and you uh, followed the installation guide, uh, you want to type activate TensorFlow, hit enter, wait, and then do, do type in Jupyter Notebook. If you're unsure about that, you can ask. So yeah, Ryan's just going to walk you through how to do work. Okay, so for those of you that may be a little bit confused, what I did is I went to my downloads folder, I went to uh, Slack, I clicked download, so now it's in my downloads folder, and all I have to do is type Jupyter. Some of you might have to type activate TensorFlow. Yeah. And then something like this should automatically open in your browser and then click on the file that says. Values are output right here. 
And uh, this is the type of the output. So the, the output is actually an NVRAM, again, not high. So basically, uh, long story short, in order to actually get an output, you do the eval method uh, if you're inside of an interactive session, with, which is what we are. So eval is a convenient way to evaluate X, but it's not actually the way most people do it. Most people do it with the session.run method. So as you can see here, we're saying session.run, and then we want the values of X, Y, and Z. And so this is why it's useful. You can fetch multiple tensors out in one step. You don't have to do eval for each of them. And so Python, if you haven't used Python, then basically what's going on is this is returning a list, and then it's getting unpacked into each of these variables. So X eval is set to the first element of the list, Y the second, Z the third. Um, and now if we print that out, then we can see that we get the values that we expect. So what makes TensorFlow unique from a couple other libraries out there is that TensorFlow, like I said before, you define how you do something before you actually get the results. And the aspect of TensorFlow where all that is stored is called the TensorFlow graph. So the TensorFlow graph is essentially just a, it, it is what you see here, it's pretty complicated. Basically, every single node of the graph is some operation or tensor, and then these lines between them represent data flow through the graph. So, for example, this map mole operation depends on x input. So, I can't calculate this until I calculate this. Now, this graph looks pretty crazy, and it's actually what we're implementing today. But don't worry, because um, there's this thing called tf.variable scope, uh, which simplifies how it looks. So, this is a simpler version of how the graph works. And we've kind of grouped a bunch of these nodes together. So you have your weights and your biases, your input goes into the softmax, it gets multiplied by the weights and biases, and then it gets passed into cross entropy, which is your loss function, and then you calculate the accuracy, and then you have your optimizer, which trains using gradient descent, and that depends on all these different things, which one of which is you know the output of cross entropy. So this is the last step where you understand what's going on. Um, you can reset the graph using tf.reset uh, default graph, which we'll be doing a couple of times throughout this tutorial just to kind of clear all our code. Um, and so don't, like I said, don't worry about the specifics of this too much because you're going to be coding later. Right now this is just the introduction to the code and stuff. So there, first of all, before I continue any further, do y'all have any questions? Because I know I'm speeding through this. Yes. Yes. So, 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 so
Um, there are, however, there's a problem with TS.const, right? If I want to feed my model a new set of images for every single training step, I can't put that in tf.constant because by definition constant can't change. So I need something that I can feed data into to be able to have the model operate on that data. And so that is what a tf.placeholder is. So a tf.placeholder is a tensor that cannot be directly evaluated. Um, if you try to do session.run and then you put in the value of that tensor, it will give you an error unless if you feed data into it. And that's the key thing. You have to feed data into your tensor in order for it to not throw an error. So, for example, we've defined this placeholder right here. And so we're just going to call it x. It's got a shape none to. What this means is that the first dimension of the tensor can be any size. It can be 10 elements, it can be 1,000 elements. Second dimension has to be slice two. And so any data that we feed in has to obey the shape and shape, otherwise the tensor will give us an error. And the data holds um, just a floating point number, and we've named it x. And so now we can define a, we can square every element of x, and we're going to assign that to the variable x2. And then if we try to just run x2, we're going to get an error. And that's because TensorFlow looks at the graph and it says, oh, well, we said x2 is equal to some operation on x. That means we have to know the value of x in order to do x2. But we never told TensorFlow what x has. We have never fed data into x yet, so it gives us an error. Now, in order to do this correctly, we use the feedDict argument of session.run. So the feedDict argument is right here. Um, for, those, for those of you that have used Python, all you have to do is you just create a Python dict, and the key is the tensor in question, and the value is you know, the value that you're feeding into the tensor, and you pass that into the feedDict argument, and then you'll be able to actually compute the um, value of the tensor. So quick show of hands. Who here does not know Python? Okay. You don't know. All right. Um, so, we've explained in the comments a little bit how it works. It's just key value. Um, the key being the tensor value that I passed in. So, in this case, input 1 is the value that we're passing in. Input 2 is another value we're passing in. And then we just do two separate session.run calls, where each time we're feeding in a different value of x. And that obviously gives us a different result. So you might be able to start seeing how TensorFlow can start being useful. But we define the super complex computation. Right now it's only squaring something, but you can imagine that it's something very complex. At the end of the day, all we have to do is feed in some data and then run session.run and open some output. Um, so that's all well and good, but we, we don't have something that can hold a state between session.run and calls. So for example, in our linear classifier, our parameters have to update, right? We have to update the parameters. And that means that we need something that TensorFlow can modify. And so just having a placeholder a constant isn't going to work. Because in a placeholder, you can tell it what the value is. And constant, it can never change. But we don't want to tell it what the value is. We want TensorFlow to figure out what the value should be and then just change the force. So that is called a tf.variable. So this is how you create a tf.variable right here in this line. And essentially we give it some tensor or initializer that will initialize the variable. So in this case, we're saying, okay, x is going to be something that follows a normal distribution um, and it's going to be a shape, 10 function. And so we create the variable and if we print out the variable, it actually looks the same as the tensor. What's important to note is that it is not a tensor as is evident by when we do type of x. And so, the reason why it's not a tensor, for starters, is if I try to just get the value of the variable, it's going to give me an error. And that is because in order for TensorFlow to use the variable, it has to initialize it. And the reason for this is that the variable exists outside of the session. So up to this point, everything, every tensor that we can find, we put on the graph. And then we started a session to kind of manage all those sensors. So the variable actually exists outside of the session, which is why you can do multiple session.run calls, and the value of the variables will stay the same unless the tensor flow changes. 
So, in order to properly use X, we have to run this tf.global variables initializer operation. Um, and so, right now, at this line, we haven't run anything yet, right? Because this is just an operation. We have to use session.run to run things. So we do session.run in it, and that initializes this operation. Or sorry, that, that initializes the variable and runs the initialization operation. And then we can get the value of x. So if I run this, <coughs> if I run this, it'll just generate a random tensor. And every time I run um, the initializer, it will recompute the value of the tensor that we specified as the initializer, which is up here. So every time we run tf.global variables initializer, it'll recompute this. And so I can demonstrate that by just running it a couple times, and you'll see that every time these numbers are different. So it might not necessarily be clear to you why we need the variable, um, but in the moment we're going to explain how TensorFlow optimizes things and it will become a little bit more evident as to what makes it so useful. Before I move on though, questions? What's the difference between a variable and a placeholder? Right, so a placeholder we manually set the values at every single session dot run. A variable we either don't have to, we don't have to tell it what it's going to do. Um, we've defined within TensorFlow what the variable is going to do. Sorry, give me one Yeah, talking for, talking for a long time. Okay. <laughs> um, so TensorFlow can't set placeholders on its own. Right. So in placeholder, we have to do that. With the variable, um, we're we're not telling it what to do. TensorFlow is going to update it for us. So for example, when we do gradient descent, we don't know what we should set the variable to. TensorFlow knows so, though, and it's going to update that for us. Can we change the value ourselves? Uh, for any other tensor, yes, using the same feedback method that we're doing. You don't actually have to only use placeholders for feedback. Um, but for variables, no, you have to call this assign operation, and then you have to run that assign operation, which is a little bit more complicated than that's something we're covering today. Um, does anyone have further questions before we continue on to optimization? Yes. Say again? So the assign operation is something different, and we're not covering it today. The global variable initializer is what initializes the variable in the beginning. We, we run it once, usually, and then we're done. Like, we don't change the variable. Yeah, so whatever it gets initialized to is going to be what I specified when I created the variable. So up here I said it would be random, so it will be initialized. Are there further questions? Yes? So does a tensor just store a matrix then? It can be, a it is a matrix if it's only in 2D. But the important thing about a tensor, a tensor is that it can have many dimensions. It could be a 4D uh, tensor, so that would be like a matrix in four dimensions. Um, so technically a matrix is only 2D, which is why we call these tensors. A tensor is the generalization of a matrix to higher dimensions. So will the tensor represent a data or represent an operation? Um, anything where you need a number. So we our data set will be in a NumPy array and we'll feed it into a tensor. And then as that passes through our model, it'll get modified, right? And then each intermediate value is also a tensor. And then at the end, it will output a tensor, which then gets converted into a NumPy array. So what's, the session session what's the difference between the tensor and like the vector the vectors we use with the linear class? <laughs> a vector is a tensor. It's just a 1D tensor. It's a tensor in one. <laughs> I guess generalized object. For example, if you have a colored image, you have a matrix, but you have three layers, right? Like RGB. In that case, this is already uh, something called a tensor. Okay. Yeah, it's, not a, it's not necessarily a matrix. Okay. Are there any more questions? Yes. What is the difference between session and interactive session? Sorry. Right. So, if we're using something like Jupyter Notebook, interactive session is better because it, it sets sessions like the typical default sessions, so we don't have to constantly say we're doing yeah. this particular session. Um, that's not really evidence 
you guys right now because we are doing it in Jupyter Notebook and you only know one way how to do this right now. But like, if you compare it to the online sensible tutorials, you'll see that there's a little bit of a difference. Um, the core idea of what a session is though is not any different. It's just how you specify like what session you need. Don't don't worry right now, basically. Okay. Um, so moving on, I'm going to now explain how TensorFlow uses variables to actually optimize them. So I mentioned this earlier, but an important aspect of TensorFlow is that you don't need to manually compute the gradients yourself. TensorFlow does that for you because every single operation in TensorFlow, or at least almost every operation, is differentiable, um, which is an important characteristic of TensorFlow. So what we do here is I'm going to minimize a very, very simple function. I'm going to minimize x squared. And obviously, the minimum of x squared is 0, right? <coughs> so we want x to be 0, but we're assuming, for the sake of demonstration, that we didn't know what the minimum of x squared is. So the way that we do that is we say x is our variable, and we initialize it to 5. Or we say it will be initialized to 5, and we call it global variables initializer. And then we say our output is x squared. And so this is, we, you already saw all this, that's what we just did before. This line right here is the new thing. So there's this thing called tf.train.gradientDescentOptimizer. And the argument right here is the learning rate, the alpha that we talked about during our lecture. And we tell it to minimize y. And so we give it a tensor and it will say, OK, I'm going to minimize this tensor. So this thing right here is an operation, it's not a tensor. And session.run can take either tensors or operations. And so if we ask session.run, and if we, if we pass a train step in session.run, it will do this operation. And so what's essentially going to happen is TensorFlow will look at the gradient of y with respect to x and say, OK, using the gradient descent algorithm that we outlined before, what, how should I update x? And then it'll update x, and if we do that over and over and over, x will eventually reach a minimum. So if I run this, you can see um, beginning at 5, and over time it decreases until it becomes just about 0. Okay. So moving on to like some actual stuff that we've talked about. On the announcement channel, I just posted a uh, Jupyter notebook called Linear Classifier, and a data file called data underscore batch underscore 1. And so the linear classifier is a notebook that I wrote to do image classification. And there are just a couple blanks where um, we might you sort of use this tutorial and try to fill in uh, the blanks. And then once you've done that, you should have um, an, image uh, an image classifier using a linear classifier on the image data that we talked about before with the animal. Yeah, um, yeah, and we'll, we'll help you sort of fill in the blanks in terms of what should go where. Yeah, so for right now, just open that thing that you posted. And keep this up because it's going to be probably helpful to reference. Yeah. So download both the data and the linear classifier into the same folder. Raise your hand if you do not have the linear classifier Python notebook open. Okay, yes, could you assist us? 
Right, and so here, I'm saying the input length, I'm just making that a variable that I've set to 3072 because that's the length of my vectors. That's what D was, as I was referring to before. And the number of classes is 10 because uh, that's the number of different things I'm trying to classify into. And so here is where we're going to declare all the variables. And uh, you can try and do this yourselves. To try and figure it out. I'll also walk you through what you're doing. Um, so, this one might tell me what X should be. Should it just be a placeholder, a variable, or a constant? So, X will refer to my images. So, what should that be? Yeah. Do I just say what? A placeholder. Thank you. Oh, is that a placeholder? What, what should the shape of this placeholder be? What are the size? What 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 are the dimensions of my input length? Input length, right? Um, and it's going to be, um, I'm going to say an arbitrary number of columns and then 3,072 long. Or, yeah. Oh, yeah, so I'm trying to reverse. So the So this way I can either input one image at a time or two images at a time or 20 images at a time. And then I'm going to call X. Okay, next. What should Y be? Placeholder, variable, constant. Anyone? Well, these are these are the labels. Yes. Yeah. yeah, this is also the placeholder. Okay. What what should be the second dimension of the placeholder? For why? Non classic, right? Yeah. And then I'm just going to call that Y. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, because it stores binary. That's why. It's a binary. So now, what should W be? Someone that's not day one, we're looking at. Very good, right? Because this is something that we're going to optimize so that it gives us a good value. Okay, and so I'm just going to initialize these to uh, some random values. You don't need to worry about this. And so what should the shape of W be? So how many, how many rows do I need and how many columns do I need? Yeah. And the length, number of rows, and how many columns? Yeah. And then B, what should this be? Yeah.
And then the last, um, I'm just going to fill this up. Um, so TensorFlow has the softmax function already in, but of course we don't have to play that. So what you can just do is. Oh, okay. Okay. And so to generate uh, actual probabilities from the scores, I'm going to use the. Softmax function. Yeah. 